Well, our sincere thanks to Dan Walters, who uh, laid the foundation for what we're going to do next, which is a little different than what we've always done at our Capitol Summit. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about policy and politics. We have the Chamber's Executive Vice President, Jennifer Barrera, here, who uh, runs our policy program and oversees all our lobbyists and, and, um, and how we establish our policy. And also, we have Marty Wilson, uh, who is our Executive Vice President for Public Affairs, who oversees our political uh, operation here at the Chamber. And, uh, and I think um, uh, we're going to start a little bit with picking up uh, Dan's comments and uh, a little bit of discussion about um, how this all plays out in the legislature today with the governor today. And um, I'm sure what's, uh, for many national uh, journalists, well, maybe journalists is the wrong word, political pundits, the recall is the entertainment of the year for, for them uh, since they don't have a, a, an entertaining president like they used to. So um, they're looking for things to talk about, and we're going to talk about that. So, uh, Jennifer, uh, can you talk a little bit about how do you see this playing out in the legislature? You know, we have, um, Dan talked about the demographics. Um, you know, the governor's got uh, plenty of money to spend, but you uh, can't buy rainwater. So we, we're in the middle of a drought, and and are those an important issues? We have um, energy reliability issues that last year we almost uh, shut power off during the hottest days. So are a number of issues that are in front of Californians that affect California business. How do we see the legislature? What are they doing and what are they addressing? Yes, thank you so much, Alan, for the introduction. Uh, it's so great to connect with all of you here today and be able to talk with you about what's going on at the California legislature. There's a ton of activity, of course, and so I'm happy to be able to present those issues to you here today. Um, as Alan indicated, there are you know a number of issues facing California with regards to the drought, the energy issues that we have, housing, homelessness, uh, just a number of activities going on. And the legislature is certainly doing what they do best, which is uh, introducing bills and moving them through the process. Uh, there's over 2,400 bills that have been introduced this year on, again, a number of issues. Uh, Cal Chamber is engaged on over 100 of, those, 100 of those bills, either support or opposition. And so we certainly uh, have our work created or cut out for us this year. We're at the point in the legislative process where the uh, members are having to face the House of Origin deadline, uh, where they have to get their bills out of their respective houses in order for those bills to continue moving through the process. That deadline is June 4th, so we are all preparing to deal with the floor votes in both houses on a number of bills. And there's three that I actually wanted to highlight for you here today, if I can, to really get your support in our efforts at the state level to stop these bills before they move on uh, to the second house. And so if we can, um, it'd be great to, I have a, a brief PowerPoint presentation with these bills identified so you can write them down um, and become familiar with them. And hopefully, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, support our efforts here at the state level by, by reaching out to your local legislators. So we'll go ahead and get started with that if we can, Shandy. Thank you. Um, the first one that I wanted to highlight is AB 995 by Assemblymember Lorena Gonzalez. It's dealing with paid sick leave. And as many of you are already familiar with, California has a paid sick leave requirement here that was introduced and authored by Assemblymember Gonzalez several years ago. AB 995 seeks to increase that mandate. So right now, uh, California employers of all sizes, even an employer with only one employee, is required to provide at a minimum three days of paid sick leave or 24 hours of paid sick leave, whichever is greater. And that also comes with some challenges with implementation, such as how an employer accrues the paid sick leave, how they document that on a wage statement, notice requirements, and of course, uh, uh, enforced through a private right of action. Um, so the paid sick leave requirement of three days is being proposed to increase to five days or a minimum of 40 hours in AB 995. This is challenging for a number of reasons. One, a new mandate on employers who are already struggling as a result of the pandemic, who have been financially devastated by the pandemic and are just having the opportunity to reopen and re rebound from the devastation they have face for this last year should not be subjected to a new mandate and a paid mandate on top of it. Now is just not the time. Uh, but in addition to that, California already has implemented COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave. That was just passed 
earlier this year as a part of the budget process and requires employers to provide 80 hours of paid sick leave for employees for any reason related to COVID, whether an individual has COVID, taking care of an individual with COVID, has potentially been exposed, uh, getting the vaccination or having side effects of vaccination. So employers are already dealing with that paid mandate. And then in addition to that, California employers this year of, uh, with employees of only five or more are already dealing with the California Family Rights expansion that went into effect in January and requires employers to provide 12 weeks of time off for employees for medical reasons, taking care of family members or taking care of themselves. So again, employers are already challenged with a lot of uh, mandates that just went into effect this year. They're uh, struggling coming back from the, the pandemic and trying to rebound from that. And again, we just don't need a new mandate like an expansion of paid sick leave at this time. So we are encouraging all of you to reach out to your legislators, um, echo those concerns, uh, ask them to vote, vote no. I can uh, express to you how important it is for the legislators to hear from their, their uh, businesses in their district, the employers in their district. It makes a huge difference. We appreciate your support on that. The next bill that I wanted to bring to your attention is AB 1119 by Assemblymember Wicks. This is dealing with the Fair Employment and Housing Act, which is California's anti-discrimination mm -hmm. law. And it seeks, it seeks excuse me, to expand that in two ways. One, it wants to create a new protected status under the Fair Employment and Housing Act for anyone who has family responsibilities, meaning they're caring for a minor or they're caring for uh, a dependent in some way, either an uh, elderly dependent or again, a minor uh, who needs medical assistance. And it would create a protected classification, meaning that if any employee is disciplined um, and falls within this protected classification, that individual can say that they were uh, disciplined or terminated perhaps on the basis of their protected status as someone with a family responsibility as opposed to violating the company policy, for example. Um, maybe an employee has a number of, un of unexcused absences at work and the employer has a policy that uh, disciplines an employee for unexcused absences. If the employee says, well, those unexcused absences were due to my family responsibilities, there becomes a question as to whether or not the employer can actually take that adverse employment action without being subject to potential litigation for discriminating against the individual due to their family responsibilities. It creates a huge challenge for employers who are trying to manage their workplaces and subjects them to litigation unnecessarily. The bill also proposes to amend the Fair Employment and Housing Act to require an employer to accommodate an employee who has uh, family responsibilities with regards to a school that's closed, unexpectedly or a care center that's closed unexpectedly. Obviously, as a result of the pandemic, we saw a lot of employers and employees struggling with school shutdowns, care facility shutdowns. But this bill goes beyond that. And really, anytime there's a school closure or care uh, center closure, it re would require an employer to accommodate an employee, which would include providing unlimited uh, time off, providing um, a, an extended leave of absence at times for the employee, and again, creating a huge challenge for employers to manage their workplace. So again, we're asking you to reach out to your legislators on this one, uh, tell them to vote no on this new burden on small employers. Again, FIHA is applicable to anyone with five or more employees and really uh, support our efforts to try and stop this bill before it moves on through the process. The last bill that I wanted to highlight for you is AB 71 by assembly member Luce Revis. And this one is a tax increase on companies that operate internationally and do business here in California. As you just heard from Dan Walters, uh, the, the state has more than enough money right now. Uh, we're looking at a $75 billion surplus. And so now is definitely not the time to be increasing taxes anymore here in California. But nonetheless, this bill has been moving through the process and we are concerned uh, with trying to stop it on the assembly floor before it moves uh, any further. The bill, as I mentioned, would be applicable to companies um, that operate internationally and do business here in California. It would increase the amount of income that they're required to appropriate here at California. So of course, more tax revenue on that, on that income appropriated or allocated here to California. The estimates are that would, the tax increase would raise $350 million the first year and then over $900 million each uh, subsequent year. Uh, which is a sizable amount of money, obviously. And they propose to dedicate that 
to dealing with the homelessness crisis that we have here in California. Of course, homelessness is something that is important to everyone here in California, but raising taxes at a time when we have a budget surplus is just not necessary, and we need to, we need to say no to any further tax increases. With that, I kind of I want to lead into um, some of the discussion that Dan also brought up with regards to the governor's budget and how he has been introducing different projects that he's going to be spending some of this budget surplus on, one of them being the homelessness. Uh, just yesterday, he announced that with the $75 billion surplus that the state has, he will be dedicating $12 billion to dealing with homeless by providing rental assistance, by providing additional housing, uh, providing uh, over 15,000 workers to go out and clean up public areas for uh, encampments and along the freeways. So again, he's already dedicating resource towards this issue. We don't need another tax increase like AB 71 to really fund any more efforts on homelessness at this time. Uh, in addition to the other proposals that have been coming out in the budget, I just again wanted to highlight some of the things that Dan mentioned. One. He is proposing to put a uh, tremendous amount of money towards water and infrastructure to uh, deal with the drought. Of course, money won't make it rain here in California, but he is trying to uh, provide some re additional resources towards infrastructure, clean water, groundwater management to address some of the issues uh, that we're facing because of the drought. Um, he has also announced the Golden State Stimulus, directing payments back to taxpayers um, at a certain income level. Uh, who have dependents and providing them checks, uh, covering uh, unpaid rent and unpaid water and utility bills. And then today, although I haven't seen the details, announcing more investment in public education. So uh, we'll be looking uh, for his full May revised budget that should be coming out soon, but these daily announcements give you an indication of where some of that surplus will be being spent. With that, I'll turn it over to Marty. Yeah, uh, Marty, I think uh, is a great segue into uh, talking a little bit about the governor's priorities and uh, what has uh, proven to be, I think, for the national uh, political pundits, uh, the recall of uh, Governor Newsom. And maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about the timeline and how it works and, uh, and what to expect from what's going to happen. Sure, happy to do that. I think that uh, uh, every time Alan suggests that somehow this recall is entertainment for the, uh, the national press, I'm always uh, reminded of the saying that uh, politics is entertainment for ugly people. So <laughs> uh, I'll uh, try to uh, run through some of where we are in that process. The, the, the Kind of the dominant uh, two issues in, in the Capitol right now on the political front are the recall, of course, which Alan mentioned and I'll talk about. But I also want to spend a few minutes talking about redistricting Absolutely. Uh, and where we are in that process. Uh, Shandy, I think we've got a slide on where we are, the, the timeline here, if we could get that up. So you see these lines through the, uh, 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 this slide here in terms of the, 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 uh, the recall process. Uh, we spent you know, a fair amount of time at, at Cal Chamber uh, last fall when I realized when it began to look like this was a real, uh, a real thing that it was going to perhaps happen, really understanding the, uh, how, how long of a process this is. And because the proponents of the recall were saying, oh, yeah, we're going to get this certified and we'll have an election in uh, July or August. And that's simply not true. And even they have conceded that. So where we are now is that uh, we've received the notice from the Secretary of State that there are sufficient uh, signatures uh, for the recall to go forward. I think the proponents ended up turning in over 2 million signatures, and they had about an 80 percent validity rate. So that's good. I mean, that's a... That's a very strong performance by, uh, by the proponents at about 1.7 million uh, signatures were, uh, uh, were, were verified. Where we are now, though, is that there's a process that's fairly new to California, but it was uh, put in place by the legislature a couple of years ago when there was a recall for a legislator in, in Southern California where voters are given the opportunity to remove their signature. Maybe they felt they were sold a bill of goods. This was not something that they, they bought into, or maybe they were angry at the time, but now they've, now they've changed their mind. Um, there was some effort uh, at, at one point to talk about reaching out to voters uh, to, uh, to get them to uh, pull their signatures. The people that sign those recall petitions, their signature is, is private. It's not, it's not public information. And so I think the opponent, one, one element of the recall opposition uh, led not really by the governor's folks, but somebody else, a uh, former legislator by the name of Don Prada, uh, I think realized that they've run into kind of a brick wall. So we don't really think this is going anywhere. They have until 
our, our timeline says June 21. I think that's been accelerated a little bit, uh, probably sometime middle part of June, uh, when we get the uh, when we get the final uh, numbers from the uh, from the Secretary of State's certifying that you know the the county process is fairly complete. And then can I get that slide up there just one more time? And then what we have then is a, a bunch of uh, a process uh, that that involves the uh, Department of Finance to analyze the recall co uh, cost. Uh, and then the uh, uh, Legislative Budget Committee has to review it uh, as well, and so they probably complete this process sometime towards the end of, uh, end of August is my, my estimate, and then it actually goes to the Lieutenant Governor who says, okay, this recall is, uh, is, is ready to go and sets the election date. I think we speculated at, at, at one point that the election would be in mid-November. I think it's going to be a little earlier now, uh, if, I, if I had to guess. Uh, but still, it will be just about to the day a year before uh, the 2022 uh, gubernatorial election would, would happen um, anyway. So once they set that date, candidates have 59 days to, uh, to uh, uh, file uh, their candidacy. Uh, right now, there's some 50 or 60 candidates that uh, have indicated they want to run. Um, uh, how many end up running, I don't know. I was involved in 2003 working for Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, during that recall of Gray Davis, and we had 135 candidates uh, running uh, running for uh, for governor that year, and uh, Arnold I think got something like 48 percent of the vote. But that was an extraordinary circumstance, an extraordinary time, uh, and I I think just the atmospherics uh, of where we are today in California are much different than where we were in in 2003, for for a variety of reasons, many of which you know I think Dan touched on just in terms of the demographic changes. Uh, in the state. So uh, there's been a lot of polling on the recall. People always ask, what do the polls say? Uh, we've seen some private polling, some public polling. You know, interestingly, they all say about the same thing, uh, that there's support for the recall is somewhere just south of 40 percent. Uh, opposition to the recall is hovering right around 50, 52 percent, somewhere, somewhere in that range. So right now, the, uh, uh, the, the folks that want to recall uh, Gavin Newsom, uh, they have a, a, a steep, uh, steep hill to climb for a variety of reasons, one of which, of course, is just the, 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 uh, the, the state of play with voter registration in California. So the most enthousi enthusiastic group uh, for uh, recalling Gavin Newsom uh, are Republicans. You know, no big, uh, no big secret there. They support the recall. About 80 percent of GOP voters said that they, uh, they, they support it. Uh, a, a smaller percentage, but still a significant one, of uh, Democrats say they're they're opposed to it. That Newsom, they in their view, is doing just a fine job. His approval rating is is fairly strong, you know, right around 50%. It's declined a little bit, uh, but you know he's still in you know relatively uh, relatively uh, good good shape. Um, the uh, where the the variable lies and why some polls are bouncing all over the place is among independent voters and some. Some polls have the independent voters favoring the recall. Some have them uh, opposing. Uh, it's hard, hard to say uh, right now without looking at you know the in internals of all, all of these polls. Uh, but my guess is is that you know again uh, the the strength that the Democratic Party has in this state with uh, about 48 percent I think of the registered voters. It's over 40 percent I guess registered voters. Republicans are around 25 percent and decline to stay voters are around 20 24 percent. So. Uh, you know, the, uh, as I like to say, uh, you know, Governor Newsom is hunting uh, a pond where there's uh, a lot more ducks than, uh, than, than the other, other group has. Uh, just the last piece on it, of course, to run a successful recall campaign, it does take money. Uh, people don't realize that when Arnold Schwarzenegger ran in 2003, he was outspent. Uh, Governor uh, Davis uh, at the time had significantly more money than, uh, than Arnold Schwarzenegger, but Arnold Schwarzenegger had near universal name ID and was a celebrity and created a lot of interest in his campaign. Arnold also funded his campaign or self-funded a good chunk of it and people, uh, people forget about that. Just in terms of where we are right now with money, the leading candidate are uh, John Cox and, and Kevin Faulkner on the Republican side. Cox has raised about seven million dollars. Uh, uh, at least five or six of that is his own. Uh, Faulkner has raised a little bit over two million dollars. Uh, the, the opposition to the recall to stop the Republican recall committee has raised three and a half million dollars, has about two and a half million on hand. The, the other thing that's important to remember about the recall is the recall is just is, is actually like a ballot measure uh, campaign. 
and so the, uh, the opposition to the recall can accept donations in, uh, in unlimited amounts. And my guess is they'll have as much as they need to, uh, to, beat, it, uh, to beat it back. The candidates running for the recall are subject to contribution limits. Uh, Governor Newsom is sitting on about uh, 20, what has he got, about $24 million uh, sitting in the bank uh, for his reelection committee, but he won't have to spend that. Um, I think if we've got enough time, I'll just talk about so, it. Well, uh, before we get into reapportionment, which is important for everybody to under understand and to play a role in, let, let's just uh, talk a minute about how uh, this uh, is all going to work in practical terms. So, uh, you know, right now it's quite clear that the Democrat Party is trying to encourage all Democrats not to run uh, so that the message is this is, you know, a Republican takeover and a special election. Um, so the way it works, um, chime in a minute here, uh, Marty, but, you know, everybody gets to vote yes or no on the recall, but regardless of that, after the ballot measure, everybody gets to vote for a candidate, including the, so let's say, most of the Democrats vote no, but it still passes. They still get to pick a candidate. If at the last minute there's a credible candidate, like a Bernie Sanders, uh, on the Democrat side throws their hat in a ring, um, isn't that where the Democrats are going to likely go if it passes and vote? And so, you know, it doesn't guarantee a Republican's going to win the election, right? Right, yeah, that was always kind of one of the things that I caution the Republicans about. As I said, look, there's three things that can happen. Uh, if it qualifies for the ballot, and two of them are bad. Um, and certainly one of the, the, the bad things from a Republican perspective would be if a credible Democrat got into the race, uh, they, you know, with that many Republicans, you've got, you know, three, four, maybe five Republicans splitting up the vote that are at least what I'll call credible, uh, then uh, that, that lone uh, Democrat, again, there'll be Democrats running, but that lone, what we'll call the credible Democrat, uh, stands a very good chance of, uh, of being the next governor. Uh, and we saw that in some early polling, uh, uh, a group called Wilson Public Affairs, no, no relation, uh, a lot of us running around. Uh, the uh, uh, actually showed, I think, that uh, Via Antonio Vigoroso, former mayor of LA, would be the strongest candidate, uh, you know, again, in this hypothetical, uh, this, this hypothetical matchup. It's interesting because it is a, it's a one-two question I didn't really, uh, you're correct to point that out, Alan. So you're going to get a ballot, yes or no, uh, on the recall, and then which candidate do you choose? If no wins, doesn't matter who you chose, but uh, if somehow yes wins, uh, then, um, uh, you know, the top vote getter becomes governor, and it could be somebody with, with you know, 30% of the vote could, uh, could, be, uh, could be elected governor. So uh, a couple things, and then I think which will let you talk about reapportionment, and we'll come back to Jennifer a little bit. You know, Gray Davis not only had an energy crisis, and he also had a budget deficit. I don't think we've ever seen a governor have more than, uh, you know, anything close to a hundred billion dollar surplus to spend. And so maybe some of the issues that you've seen in the polling, as Jennifer pointed out, homelessness, affordable housing, um, you know, energy or, you know, water, certainly the drought, the governor has the ability to spend money on. Gray Davis never had that. And so things are really quite different in front of the electorate today uh, than they were in 2003. And, um, you know, the state's going to benefit from all this money. Correct. And, and uh, the governor has designated June 15th right now as the date to open up California, so, yeah. which is um, be interesting. And, and I think from your, your perspective, um, you know, as, as the, the more we improve our economy in the pandemic and people are allowed to open up and move around, uh, whether tourism comes back by the election in October or November um, may have a role to play, but um, uh, other things are coming back and, uh, and, and the economy's obviously doing well or we wouldn't have these kind of revenues. Yeah, no, he's in a very strong position. So we'll come back to the legislature in a minute in policy, but why don't you talk a little bit about reapportionment because we need everybody's involvement in that. Too. Yeah. So uh, this uh, in California, because of Propositions 11 and Proposition 20, which were supported by Cal Chamber, uh, California has a redistricting commission, a, a bipartisan independent commission that's been, uh, 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 been recruited and is now in place and waiting to do, uh, waiting to do their job. There's the delays naturally, like because of the pandemic and getting the census data, uh, so that they can actually begin the process of drawing the maps. In a normal circumstance, 
right now we would probably be in a you know pretty pretty uh, frenzied pace of looking at maps, getting comments on them, uh, and seeing which direction uh, uh, you know the the commission uh, is going. Unfortunately, again because of the pandemic, the census date has been delayed, and so the the, the commission won't actually get that information until sometime in the fall. I think that it's also important to note, and you've probably seen the stories, and certainly Dan referenced it, is California lost a congressional seat uh, for the first time, I believe, ever. Uh, so we've gone, for, we go from 53 to 52 uh, seats in the, um, in our congressional delegation. Obviously, the legislature and the Board of Equalization numbers are set uh, by our own, uh, by our own constitution. So, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of hand wringing among incumbent uh, office holders in terms of which uh, which uh, which districts get uh, get carved up. I think the conventional wisdom is is that where the impact will be the greatest in terms of loss of representation or power or however you want to describe it is going to be in what I would call the LA basin, Los Angeles, Orange County, uh, and San Gabriel Valley, where there's been the uh, the least growth. Uh, the last just little point I'll make, and uh, uh, we go back to our discussion, is that. Among the things that the, the district or the commission has to consider are communities of interest um, and uh, certainly ethnic and, and ge geographic boundaries are important, but they also, uh, they view that communities of interest are uh, uh, economic interest as well. Uh, and that's important for our local chambers to keep in mind uh, that where people work and uh, for what types of business uh, they work is going to be critically important to the commission in terms of how they draw the lines. And so there's a lot of you out there uh, watching us today on TV. I uh, wish you could all be with us in person, but uh, you know there will be a time where we're going to be reaching out and asking you to get involved uh, as business leaders and comment on, uh, on these districts. So that's a, an important aspect. So we'll come back to Jennifer and talk a little bit about the legislature and policy because you mentioned that in Congress we're going to lose a seat. But because we have quote, fewer people in California, um, the legislative districts are going to be collapsed a little bit when we redraw the lines. And they're going to be a little different. And so different legislators are going to be looking to say, where do I run? How do I, who do I, you know, who are my constituents going to be? Are they going to be any different? And uh, so, Jennifer, maybe a little bit of uh, how this all plays out, where we see the priorities in the legislature. Do we have uh, help with some unions dealing with things that want to improve the economy and make things better. And our other people, as Dan Walters said, uh, more interested in, um, uh, you know, uh, adopting the Western European uh, strategy of uh, more government is uh, better, better government. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. And we do see uh, some of this playing out in the legislature with regards to the priorities that are moving forward. And uh, what is top of mind, I guess, for the legislature uh, as it, we go through this process. So it's easy to see um, the influence of labor unions, environmentalists, and progressives with the number of bills that are moving through the process right now. As I mentioned, several of them before, those are all backed by employment labor unions, environmentalists, progressives with regards to tax increases and new labor law mandates. That's where we can really see some of the push uh, behind getting their agenda moving through the legislature. And we expect a lot of this has to do with the recall and ultimately uh, where decisions will be made on, on policy may have been influenced by, by those politics. But on the other side, interestingly, we see help from some of the labor unions when it comes to environmental issues, banning fracking in California when we have no alternatives for other uh, gas um, and the loss of jobs in the Central Valley. Um, additional mandates with regards to zero emission vehicles by uh, 2035 as the governor has uh, issued in an executive order and is currently being considered uh, in the legislature in a bill uh, moving through the assembly. In those areas, we see the building trade unions who have those jobs very concerned with the direction that some of those policies are going in and are actually opposed uh, to those moving forward. And so it really depends on the policy area involved um, and the union involved as to whether we see them pushing mandates on employers or really trying to stop some of these uh, mandates uh, that are being pushed by environmentalists and progressives. So Marty, let's uh, take that and take it translated back into the politics a little bit. Um, you know, we saw our, uh, uh, our new US Senator Alex Padilla adopt the Green New Deal with AOC. 
Um, and, you know, when he was in the legislature, he was a, a pretty balanced legislator, uh, senator here in, in California. Um, are there reasons that he has to move, let's say, to adopt the Green New Deal, even though it may not be good for the economy for his election in uh, 2022? Well, yeah, I think that, you know, the pressure on, on Democratic uh, elected officials is, is they're worried about a challenge from the left. And remember, in California, we have a top two uh, primary system, a jungle primary, whatever you want to call it. And we saw this, and, and Dan referenced it uh, earlier today, uh, where Dianne Feinstein, when she was running for uh, re-election uh, a couple of years back, I mean, almost an iconic elected official here in California, right? She's been around since, uh, what, 1992. Um, she was challenged from the left by uh, uh, the state Senate pro tem, uh, Kevin DeLeon, and he made it through the top two process and was running against her uh, when, uh, when she was running against re-election. She dispatched him fairly handily, but I think that that was kind of a warning sign for you know, Democratic elected officials that if they can uh, be sufficiently uh, progressive, I guess, for want of a better word, that they can fend off uh, the impetus for a primary challenge from you know, what we'll call the Sanders Sanders wing of the uh, of the party, the Democratic Party. So I, th I think, you know, uh, back to Jennifer's point when she mentioned the three bills, you know, uh, the involvement, especially of the small business community who has um, a great deal of sympathy over the pandemic, the consequences of the pandemic, um, to have uh, the small business community throughout California engaged in saying there are pressure. I mean, as Marty pointed out, and I think as embracing the Green New Deal. Um, uh, Senator Padilla has, has seen what the challenges will be in his reelection. So we need to counter that. We need to make sure that people appreciate what's important to business, uh, what types of energy are important to business, what type of tax structure is important to business, what kind of employment laws are important to business. So, you know, in the next year, um, you know, until the, until the next 2022 election, we need the help of everybody who's out there in, the, in watching today uh, to make sure that um, your legislator uh, knows what's going on and uh, what influences the economy and what influences small business and what you're able to, uh, uh, to deal with. I think you know, now is the time especially to um, make sure that everybody knows that you've been able to get through the pandemic. Um, some. Uh, much more difficult than others, obviously, depending on what industry you're in. And we can't afford any new burdens, um, you know, that are going to make it more difficult. And I think I bring up, and I asked Marty to bring up the political discussion about where the pressures are, because there are pressures uh, on the other side. And uh, we need to make sure that there are pressures uh, on the business side to say, we need, we can't afford these. We can't afford these new laws. Things are hard enough as they are. Um, and so, uh, you know, these are the things that are, that are really important. And, uh, um, and to make sure that uh, we have the, the ability to do the things. You know, the, the pressure, so I'll say there are certain things, you know, that, um, you know, and you see this, I think, throughout the state. It's easy when you're a Congress person or a senator when you don't have to run the state. But throughout the country, you, you know, um, some governors are more right, some governors are more left, but at the same time, you have to run the state and manage the state and adopt policies that are gonna be able to be, you know, uh, that encourage the economy to grow. And uh, I think Dan Walters really was, um, uh, pointed out an issue that's, that's gonna come forward, it's a good argument to be made, is that we are flush with revenues. There's no question about it, the state is, because the economy's doing well. And uh, because the, there's certain, you know, I, I find some of these tax increases measures to be punitive. We're gonna punish wealth, but the wealth is what creates the money to be able to have tax revenues that you can build affordable housing, you can deal with a homeless crisis, you can put money in the pockets of people who have really suffered during the pandemic. And I think that's what we see the governor uh, trying to accomplish here, um, you know, with the budget and we'll see more of it be rolled out. But 
this is where uh, your voice needs to be heard uh, really significantly and uh, getting the economy. So I'm gonna make a pitch here for all of you uh, that don't have uh, health problems on allergies or whatever, but you know the vaccines are clearly the key. We see this throughout the world that the, the countries that have been able to open up are the ones that have a high vaccination rate. So I encourage all of you to make sure that you get vaccinated um, that you're, you know, whether it be your workers or whether your family get vaccinated because we saw what happened in Europe, you know, the, the, the other part of the wealth um, of the world, other than uh, maybe parts of Asia, the European Union was in a lockdown when we were opening up because they botched their vaccine program. And so this is the difference. The vaccines are the difference. And if we want to keep opening up we want that June 15th date to be, you know, to be a firm date and move forward after that and be able to, um, you know, uh, have our events. I mean, I think really where people are struggling right now are in the hospitality industry where you don't have the ability to have, you know, events and international travel. That's what we need to improve upon. And uh, the vaccines will take us uh, forward with that. So let me, uh, let me ask a, a few questions of Jennifer because there have been a lot of burdens imposed uh, because of the pandemic uh, on safety rules for work and, and Cal OSHA has been in the, in the mix and we've been working on trying to, uh, to deal with that. And then I don't think we can leave without talking about our unemployment insurance deficit in uh, that we're borrowing money from the federal government to pay unemployment insurance claims uh, from the California uh, portion of it. So Jen? Yes, yeah, so Cal OSHA, as many of you know, passed emergency standards in November to deal with COVID in the workplace. And those, those new regulations and standards were pretty significant with regards to the burdens they imposed on employers such as exclusion pay. Um, you had to provide an unlimited amount of pay uh, time off, pay time off for employees who potentially were exposed to COVID in the workplace, um, putting up uh, barriers and dividers, ensuring social distancing, mask requirements. Um, with regards to the ag community, there were transportation uh, requirements and housing requirements that were just extremely challenging for the employers to implement um, when those were passed in November. Well, of course, we've seen as things change and CDC guidance changes and the guidelines change that we're expecting changes to those Cal OSHA regulations very soon, uh, maybe at the end of this month. And I will put in the plug to check Cal Chamber website and alerts our blog, the Capital Insider blog, that just gave a highlight of some of those changes that we expect uh, for those who are vaccinated to further emphasize what Alan just said, there'll be some relaxed requirements with regards to vaccinated employees in the workplace. Um, and uh, additional standards uh, with regards to those housing and transportation uh, measures that I suggested in the ag industry will also see some relaxing as well. So tune in for that and pay attention to some of the publications we put out on that end. But one thing I do wanna emphasize is that even though we may see on June 15th and we're hopeful on June 15th, that the economy will basically be allowed to reopen, that businesses will be allowed to reopen and really um, start operating uh, back to normal in some extent. Those regulations, those mandates for Cal OSHA with regards to COVID-19 in the workplace will still be in place. So we need to make sure employers are mindful of that and they don't assume that June 15th, that means all of the COVID-19 regulations just go away. Uh, speaking to the EDD deficit that we're facing. So uh, and starting in about May of last year, our EDD fund went insolvent meaning that we had to start borrowing from the federal government to pay unemployment benefits to all those employees who suffered job loss as a result of the pandemic. We're approximately $20 billion in deficit right now to the federal government. Uh, we have a $20 billion loan from them. It's expected from the EDD, the Employment Development Department, that that could go as high as $40 billion by the end of this year as we continue to see unemployment numbers that haven't gone down yet and individuals receiving those benefits. What that means for the employer community is that unless the government steps in and does something to reduce that loan, either at the federal level or here at the state level with the budget surplus we have, employers will ultimately be responsible for paying that debt back uh, through increased taxes. And every year uh, that the debt isn't paid off, those taxes continue to increase. It's a per employee tax, and it's basically a reduction of the federal tax credit 
um, that employers receive right now. That tax uh, requirement won't go into effect until January of 2022. However, we are pushing right now, given the budget surplus that we have, for the uh, governor to really address this huge deficit we have in the unemployment fund. And we are also advocating at the federal level for some forgiveness, although we are more likely to see some help uh, from the state level. So that's another thing that employers should be mindful of and should be expecting to see us putting out a lot of information on that as well. Yeah, and just uh, to make sure everybody, you know, because everybody's heard about the fraud at EDD, um, this is, our deficit is not due to that fraud. That fraud was mostly with the federal additional supplemental uh, program for many for independent contractors and gig workers. So that's where the fraud occurred. This is just really all the people in California applying for unemployment insurance who overtaxed our system. And uh, in order to be able to continue to pay those benefits, we had to borrow money from the federal government. And um, it was about $10 billion after the Great Recession. And it took nine or 10 years to pay that back with tax increases on all employers. We want to try to avoid that. Uh, some other states have had the, the uh, CARES money or American Rescue Plan money be uh, dedicated to that to pay down that, that debt. So um, uh, that is uh, what we're pushing for. And we'll see what happens with the extra money. And you know, with the governor's budget as part of it, and then the legislature gets to uh, engage in that. So, so I'm sorry, we're not set up today for you to ask questions to Marty and Jennifer. So write them down, put them in your pocket, come to our live event next year in Sacramento and pull them out and say, Marty, what about this? So um, we're not gonna be able to do that this year, but I wanna thank you. And there's more to the program yet. Um, right now, we have a public service announcement from our uh, major sponsor, Automobile Club of Southern California. Great game. Yes. Hey, are you good to drive? Unlike you, I've had a few. So I got a ride share. Good call. Hey, see you Thursday. See you, buddy. We know it's never okay to drink and drive. Now we need to remember that it's never okay to text and drive. Studies have shown you're distracted for up to 27 seconds after using your phone. Don't drive intoxicated. Don't drive 